Welcome to The God Culture, where we urge you to challenge tradition as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We do not intend to be confrontational, but to compare what the Bible really says versus the traditions of men, which Jesus himself rebuked. Jesus said to the Pharisees, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Mark 7, 9. We are continuing Solomon's Gold series with Part 7, The Track of the Hebrew to the Philippines. We have put forth extensive research on this topic, and this video especially was quite a challenge, as we really wanted to dot our I's and cross our T's. We embarked on this journey because we wanted to find out if the Philippines is in addition to matching the Bible, history, and geography uh, from our search for Solomon's gold thus far, actually had some residual elements of Hebrew in some of its names or languages somewhere. This would prove further the match of the Philippines with Ophir, Sheba, Tarshish, and ancient Havilah. Even though we are not necessarily Hebrew scholars, we have been able to find more evidence than we could have imagined. It seems every facet of this topic that we delve into has an abundance of factual support. We did not expect this initially, but as we said before, we are now 100% convinced that Philippines is in fact the land of Ophir. If you are a Hebrew scholar and you are viewing this series, please understand that we are not Hebrew scholars, but we are looking for possible links here in our crusade for knowledge in locating Ophir, which we believe to be the Philippines. If the Philippines is Ophir, then we believe there should be some connection to Hebrew in some way. We believe we have already supported our case conclusively, and we are adding this exhaustive study to prove all things on this topic. It only takes a few Hebrew references to strengthen our position here, and we have found what appear to be several. Regardless, we apologize in advance as some of our pronunciations may be off, but we will not allow that to intimidate us. If you are not a Hebrew scholar, please understand that you do not require one to conduct your own research. There are plenty of cross-referenced websites out there, and Strong's Concordance is simple to use, if nothing else. It may actually be better because these so-called Hebrew scholars have missed all of this in the Bible for thousands of years. We will discuss this in detail in another series. Today, we are looking for a connection to he the Hebrew language in this video, especially in place names. There is no doubt the Spanish named cities and areas of the Philippines. However, we believe some Hebrew survived, as we will show you the Spanish attempted to even rename areas that were never changed. The Filipinos never accepted this renaming by the Spanish. As for the Philippines, there is far more Hebrew there than most everyone realizes. Join us as we follow the track of the Hebrew to the Philippines. Our story begins with the separation of Peleg, who headed west, fathering Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, and Joktan, his brother, and Joktan's sons, who headed east, about 100 years after God confused the languages of the earth at the Tower of Babel and dispersed the people. We believe both families still spoke the original Hebrew language of Noah and Shem, as they do not appear to have been involved in the Tower of Babel confusing of languages. So in Genesis 10, 25 through 30, in the Table of Nations, it says, And unto Eber were born two sons. Remember, Eber is Hebrew. From Eber is Hebrew. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. Big key. 
And his brother's name was Joktan. And Joktan begot, as you see, 13 sons. We won't try to pronounce them all. The ones that tie to this story, however, are Sheba and Ophir and Havilah. And then there's Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan, and their dwelling was from Misha, as thou goest unto Safar, a mount of the east. Eber is where we get the word Hebrew from Eber. Peleg indisputably fathered the lineage including Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the patriarchs of the twelve tribes of Israel, through David, Solomon, all the way to Jesus and beyond. They are Israelite Hebrews. Note, you don't see Ashkenaz in this lineup anywhere in the Bible, the Torah. However, Abraham's descendants are not the only Hebrews, as Joktan and his sons and his lineage are also from Eber, Hebrew. This is why we make the point that the Queen of Sheba in 1 Kings 9 and 10 was not likely hearing about the God for the first time, but she was happy to find kin in Solomon, whose wisdom ministered to her. And we're going to bring this home in this video. We believe she returned to her land in the Philippines, Cebu, and shared this message with everyone, which we believe Jesus tells us was well received, and this was why he compared Sheba, Philippines, to the repentance of Nineveh in Matthew 12.42. So, the sons of Joktan lived from Misha to the east to Sephar. We had determined in our first video that Misha is Mashad Iran. And here is the map indicating Misha and the areas to the east, as the passage says. Notice again, Ethiopia, Yemen, Spain, they're all west, not east. They don't fit. And their dwelling was from Misha, Mashad, Iran, as thou goest unto Safar, a mount of the east. So this is where we pick up. Where is Safar, mount of the east? You are going to love this. Safar, Safara in Hebrew, means towards a numerous population. Note, in the original Hebrew, this word is not capitalized as a name. Instead, this is a clue and a direction, not a name. Where is the most numerous of populations? Well, the Orient. We know someone is thinking, however, well, not back then, right? Well, of special note, Joktan also had the most numerous of sons in the entire table of nations. Yet another coincidence? Eh, maybe. Also, the name Joktan means small. This is another clue. However, before the political correctness police step in, height is not might, no matter what Sheriffer tells you. Pacquiao seems to do quite well without being six feet tall. Then we have a mount of the east. In Hebrew, Har Hakadim. Translation, a mountain of the Orient. So we are looking for a mountain in the Orient, perhaps one bearing a Hebrew name, if one exists. Again, we do not believe Safar was a name, but a direction. We searched the entire Orient and could only find two countries with significant mountains that bear Hebrew names. One is Mount Ophir, which was disingenuously named by the British in 1801 in Indonesia as a response to the Spanish finding the land of Ophir, which has Tons of support, yet no support for Ophir being in Indonesia. This is a bogus name. 
it is not of Hebrew origin as far as being named in ancient times. We cannot find any history tying King Solomon nor the Phoenicians from Tyre to that Mount Ophir, and even the locals will not refer to it as Mount Ophir, but its original name in Indonesian. However, the second country is quite a revelation, and they don't just have one mountain, but several with Hebrew names. At first, if you ask the locals, few would even know that this mountain's name originates from Hebrew, and it could not tie more perfectly to our search for Solomon's gold, the land of Ophir. First, another quick look at our base scripture. Eber had two sons, Peleg and Joktan, Hebrews from Eber, all. Joktan's sons, Ophir, Sheba, and Havila, headed to the Orient towards a numerous population of smaller people, Joktan's meaning. Could there be a mountain that fits this narrative somehow? Well, your search is over because this one is so obvious, it is going to bump you in the head. The third tallest mountain in the country of the Philippines and the very tallest mountain on Luzon Island is Mount Pulag. Wait, you see where we are going here? Pulag and Peleg are similar, so they must be the same, right? Oh, no. No, no. This is far better than that. Puleg is not just similar to Peleg. It is the very same word in Hebrew. In Hebrew, the letters within a word can change, modifying the definition of the word to match the use of the word. In this case, Peleg, Eber's son and Joktan's brother, and the grandfather of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, means divided. However, changing the E, Peleg, to a U, Pulag, modifies the meaning to say it was divided. What would that have to do with anything you say? Well, Genesis 10.25 tells us that Peleg was very significant as in his days was the earth divided. Whoa! Are you getting this? There is a very significant mountain in Luzon with not only a Hebrew name, but the very name of Joktan's brother Peleg, who fathered Israel, and the variation of the name bears the same exact meaning as his purpose stated in the Table of Nations. With all the other evidence that has been mounting in this series, this is it. We could end this video right here, and even Hebrew scholars could not argue, at least not effectively. However, this is only the beginning. At the foot of Mount Pulag lies Kabayan, which is also of Hebrew origin, meaning Yah, or God, has hidden. God has hidden what? Well, there are mysterious mummies found in the caves in this region called fire mummies that were preserved through a lengthy dehydration and smoking process, which actually is similar to that of ancient Egypt. But how did that get to the Philippines? Hmm. Also, some assert that this ritual may be more than 2,000 years old. What if this were a ritual handed down from times even before the flood? No one knows the origin of it. Sound crazy? Let's go a little farther north. Sagada is an area which also bears a name of Hebrew origin meaning to no praise. Appropriate. There they have yet another very rare burial ritual where they hang caskets from the sides of cliffs. 
Nobody knows, once again, where this ritual came from, and it appears to be more than 2,000 years old again. Hmm. Could it be that this ritual began prior to the flood, and the inhabitants of ancient Havila, Ophir, Philippines today, raise their caskets to the highest level possible so they might survive the flood. Makes sense? Perhaps. We'll cover the tribe that does this later. We took a look at the most significant of mountains, volcanoes, which would be more difficult for the Spanish to rename. We searched throughout the Philippines for more Hebrew names, and do you know what we found? Mount Arayat in Hebrew literally means earth covered. What are the odds of that? Could this be the mountain that Noah built the ark? If you have not seen part 10 of our series, that may seem like a large claim, but we prove this in great detail. Odd, it also sounds very similar to Ararat, which are the mountains where the ark landed, which we know was not Turkey, but more likely Mount Everest. We are not suggesting this is where the ark landed. However, we are suggesting that based on its Hebrew name and the fact that we believe this to be ancient Havilah, home of Noah, see part 10, that Noah built the ark near the top of Mount Ariah and was lifted from there. We thought perhaps Mount Apo might bear this honor, but further research uncovers that the earth was covered at this point, thus the name. Wow. But that's nowhere near all. Remember in the 1990s when the mighty Mount Pinatubo erupted? Well, once again... Two Hebrew words, God raises his goodness. Wow. Or how about Mount Kabu Yau, great house of the creator God. Mount Mayon, spring of water in Hebrew. To all volcano and lake, called out for a specific purpose. Is anyone else noticing a pattern here? Not only are these Hebrew words, but many refer to God and even make sense. Calculate the odds of that. Then show us another country on earth that has such. Certainly not Ethiopia, Yemen, or any of the other places claiming to be Ophir, Tarshish, or Sheba. But this next one is going to blow your mind. Mount Kabalian is known as the Hidden Mountain today. Did you know the Hebrew definition of these two words is greatly hidden? That's an impossible coincidence. Again, this is enough evidence already to call it a day, but we are nowhere near done. Mount Banahau, built by Creator God. Coincidence? How about one that ties directly to Solomon's temple? Yep, we got that too. Mount Matutum. Matu means to totter, shake, slide. No volcano would ever do that, right? Tum is the Hebrew plural of Tom, meaning perfections or jewels. But not just any jewels. No, one of the epithets, jewels, of the objects in the high priest's breastplate as an emblem of complete truth? Tumim? Wow! Wait a minute. So, there's a mountain actually named for the jewels worn by the high priest of Solomon's temple? 
an emblem of complete truth? Is this the actual location where the jewels came from for the breastplate of the high priest? Statistically, this is impossible as chance. There is only one way all of this ties together this well. God put it there for us to find. This is how the Bible works when you are seeking truth. We are not stretching definitions that might possibly fit here. This is an exact match to the search for Solomon's gold, including a mountain bearing Peleg's very name. One citing the flood, several expressing God's goodness in his creation, one that bears the same meaning in Hebrew as has been given to it in modern times. No, this is not a possibility of chance whatsoever. The ancestors of this land are speaking to us, and their names for these mountains have survived, but we're still not done. Uriah, wakefulness of Creator God. And here's one that's really going to shock you. Everyone in the Philippines knows what Balut is, but did you know it's Hebrew? The Balut Volcano and Island. In Hebrew, Balut means acorn. We know this doesn't sound like the duck egg that you bury in the ground and then eat, does it? Well, unless you consider that this is the exact same process that a squirrel uses to bury an acorn. If you haven't tried balut, well, we wouldn't know because we're too chicken to eat it. (laughs) But maybe someday. Okay. We have exhausted the volcanoes for the most part, but remember, we mentioned that the Spanish attempted to rename some areas unsuccessfully. Here is a map of Luzon Island, in which the Spanish called it Luzon. If you remember, this is a variant spelling of Lucos, referring to the Phoenicians that Solomon sent to trade there. In 1571, it's simply Luzon. But in 1734 and 1785, the maps attempt to rename it unsuccessfully as Nueva Castilla. Never took, though. In fact, everyone assumes that Isabella province is named for Queen Isabella, But would a Spanish cartographer actually get away with misspelling the queen's name with only one L without losing his head? Or is this the actual Isabella of Hebrew origin, according to Wikipedia? We don't know, but it's certainly worth questioning. Just as the gold region and river, Abra, Wikipedia tells us it's of Spanish origin. Maybe, but... Did you know Abra is also a Hebrew word meaning mother of multitudes? It is also supposed that Solomon's favorite concubine was named Abra, though we cannot find that in the Bible. What we do know about Abra is that history documents it as an ancient gold mining area according to a case study from the Ilocos Sur Archaeology Project, who also cites the Philippines as the famous Indian islands of gold. Funny that some claim India to be Ophir, yet India even named the place where they got their gold. And we have already shown you evidence that is the Philippines. The Indus Valley, which supposedly has a claim of being Ophir, wasn't even a thriving civilization at the time of Solomon. And it's a ludicrous shot in the dark. 
just look at the regions around Abra for more. We already covered several mountains near Abra with Hebrew names as well as Sagada and Kabayan, but did you know that Apayao, Kagayan, Ifugao, and possibly even Isabella yield Hebrew names as well? And could Ilocos be a variant of the Lucos or the Phoenicians who traded in the coastal areas of the northern coasts of Luzon? Could be. But Ifugao is of special note. In Hebrew, it means son of the honored one. Which honored one? Well, likely Peleg, who had the honor of having the earth divided in his days. Maybe this even points to a population of Israelite Hebrews? Well, the Igorot people who live in Ifugao and surrounding areas are a mystery. Igorot is a Hebrew word meaning letters. We do not know a certain application for this meaning in this case, but their language has been likened to that of Hebrew and even their law. Ranks fairly with Hebrew law. The purpose of this video is not to prove the Igorats or other tribes are Hebrew, but we are seeking Hebrew words, and we have already found many. There is another people worth noting, however. The Askaya tribe of Bahul actually claim to descend from the builders of Solomon's temple. This is quite a claim, and we cannot prove it to date, but... We cannot deny it either, and with all of the overwhelming evidence, this should be completely explored and not placed aside by scholars. It very well could be true. Jess B. Tyrol wrote extensively that this language was similar to Hebrew, and he believed that they were actually of Hebrew origin. Again, we are not linguists and cannot conclude the same at this point, but find this to be very likely. Another point raised by Padre Carino, where he even said that it, the Tagalog language, has the mystery and obscurities of the Hebrew language. So he even believed that there were similarities between Tagalog, the national language of the Philippines, and Hebrew. Stephen Levinson, a linguist, wrote, At the end of the workshop, one mother tongue translator remarked that, had he known of the parallels between Philippine languages and Biblical Hebrew, he would have found the learning of the latter, Hebrew, much easier. His remark led me to raise the matter with a couple of seminary professors who teach Hebrew in Manila. Are these professors ignoring all this evidence? Have you ever heard the things we have covered in this series before? Certainly not in Jesuit schools, because those are the same Jesuits who began to document the culture of the Philippines and then hijacked it and its history. Somehow, though, most Filipinos remain Catholic, and we urge you to connect the dots and see the truth. Ready for more? Did you know Sabah, Saba, does not only mean banana, but in Hebrew the word means abundant, filled to satisfaction? Don't those definitions fit one of the most abundant fruits in all of the Philippines? And we already covered the Nara tree, the national tree of the Philippines, which we believe was used to build the ark, and that is why it was so significant that Solomon desired it to build the pillars and terraces of the temple. And again, it ties to the Queen of Sheba, she who must be admired. So now we're going to hit you 
with several other Hebrew words we found in our search all around the Philippines. This is not all of them, but some we felt were significant. In Hebrew, loag, mock, deride, stammer, in speech, kubayao, hiding place, bukid, manila, depopulate, not sure about that one, naga city, touch, reach, probably reach, strike, bikul, I pray ordinarily, wow, pasig, pursuing gold. Did that happen in the Philippines? Of course. Palawan, Yah's extraordinary grace. We can't think of a more appropriate description of Palawan, one of the most beautiful places on earth and being discovered as we speak. Samar, to bristle up. But could this actually tie to the Samaritans? The ten lost tribes of Israel lived in the northern kingdom and was actually called Israel, which became known as Samaria. Judea was the southern kingdom. The ten lost tribes were taken away by Assyria, but no one knows where they ended up from there. Could some of them have traveled to Ophir? Very probable. There are claims of such, in fact, but... That is beyond the focus of this video. Bahol, originally, Bahol. Hebrew, it means their job was to go or come. They were merchants, travelers of the sea, more than likely. Mindoro, kind gift of God. Wow. Menit, dart greedily from dwelling. Suragal, defiled princess. We have no idea how that story came to be. But let's keep going south because these words are everywhere. Muleta River were filled. A river was filled? Really? Could there be a better fit? Mindanao, be eminent, precious. Sulu Sea. Sulu is Akkadian or Phoenician for highway. Might Hiram, king of Tyre, have referred to the Sulu Sea in his own language as a highway? Certainly. Celeb Sea. Dogs. Many referred to pirates as dogs. Were these waters known for pirates? Masara in Compostela, gold territory, means deliver. Yet another match to another gold region. Cagayan de Oro. Of course, this one must be Spanish, right? Or does the Hebrew meaning, Mountain of the Feast of Yah, make sense as well? But this is the most significant of all. Just what God did the Philippines serve before being conquered by the Spanish Catholic Holy Roman Empire. A pagan one, as we are told? What did the Spanish historians observe when they arrived? From the journal of Antonio Pigafetta, who traveled with Magellan, the inhabitants, Filipinos, responded that they had no other god but raising their clasped hands and their face to the sky and that they called their God Abba. Abba? Who is Abba? This doesn't sound like the supposed pagan God of the Philippines that the Catholics had to eradicate, does it? Nope. Abba is Aramaic for my father. Not just father, as you may have heard, but the more endearing my Father, which was spoken by Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mark 14, 36, and he said, Jesus, Abba, Father, my Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. How did the Filipinos 
know how to speak Spanish and worship their God in Spanish before the Spanish ever arrived? Answer, they didn't. They were speaking ancient Aramaic, just as Jesus was, referring to the God, Y-H-W-H, Yahuwah. So, what exactly did the Catholics eradicate? Well, we learned practically all Filipinos had lots of gold inherited over thousands of years from their ancestors. Yep, that was eradicated, all right. We learned Filipinos had a flat-level government in which the barangays were the very highest authority, similar to the culture of Noah, Abraham, Adam, and Moses. Gone. No longer there. Eradicated. And now we find they were already serving the God that Jesus served before the Catholics even arrived. They had to wipe that out, too, along with your history, and you allow them to control the masses of your country still today? Your education institutions? Hmm. Perhaps it's time to follow Jesus' prophecy and rise up and condemn this generation as he says you will. We will discuss this further in Part 9 future prophecies of the Philippines. Now for some conclusions. Based on our research, we believe we can point to the general areas of Ophir, Sheba, and Tarshish within the Philippine archipelago. Remember, though, that just as the whole country is referred to as Philippines today, as well as the Luzon Empire prior, and other names in the past, we believe the entire country was known as the land of Ophir, even though Ophir itself refers to a region within. This is our hypothesis based on evidence we have tied together. The Lucos we covered are the Phoenicians Solomon sent to trade for gold, wood, and resources, Hiram, king of Tyre. The Hebrew definition of the word even fits nicely. Lukos equals Luzon, which equals Ophir. Even Dr. Jose Rizal, Fernando Blumentritt, and James Alexander Robertson contended that Ophir was the whole of Luzon. There is a claim from Mindoro as well as Ophir, which again, all of the Philippines would have been known as Ophir, but we believe Mindoro, which sits just south of Luzon, would have fallen under the banner of Ophir as well as some other islands. Therefore, Luzon and some of the surrounding islands are Ophir. In our Queen of Sheba Revisited video, part two, we drew the conclusion that Cebu, formerly spelled with an S and an SH, was Shebu, which is a variant of Sheba. We have heard from some who believe it to be Saba, but we have never found any evidence leading to there, but further evidence that Cebu is in fact Sheba. In fact, one of our viewers pointed out that Cebu is actually named Queen City of the South, and that is too much of a match to Jesus' referring to the Queen of Sheba as the Queen of the South at the uttermost parts of the earth. Therefore, we hypothesize that Cebu and probably Bahol and other surrounding islands fell under the kingdom of Sheba, Ophir's brother, not the grandson of Cush from Ethiopia, remember. The final area of Tarshish would be kind of obvious at this point, but why settle for the easy route? We have even read claims online that Samar and even portions of Mindanao have claims to have been Tarshish, 
But is there evidence? There's one mountain we have saved for the last, and it holds the clue to Tarshish, we believe. One we have never seen anyone propose. But first, who was Tarshish again? Genesis 10, 4, and 5. And the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim, Dodan, Dedan. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families in their nations. Javan founded the area of Greece, and that's pretty well supported from what we've seen. In other words, he probably spoke Greek and not Hebrew. We know that his sons took to the seas, began boating, and founded the isles, according to this very passage, after their own tongue, Greek. So we are looking for a Greek tie in language to the land of Tarshish, not necessarily Hebrew. How about a big one? Now, we mean a really big one. No, we mean the biggest one. How about 9,000 feet tall? Okay, you guessed it. It's Mount Apo, the tallest mountain in the Philippines, the grandfather of all Philippine mountains. Apo is a loan word from Greek. It means away from, denoting the furthest point in the orbit of a body in relation to the primary. It is practically the furthest point east in the Philippines at the uttermost parts of the earth. We've seen that as a description of Ophir and Tarshish many times. In Tagalog, Apo means elder, ancestor, or grandchild. Perhaps... Regarding Tarshish, the grandson of Japheth, Noah's son, and survivor of the flood, or even better, Noah himself, the ancestor or elder, both of which who lived in this area prior to the flood, we believe. But this is Greek, certainly not a Spanish word in any sense, and Tarshish son of Javan, who founded Greece, likely spoke Greek, and would have named the largest mountain in his land in Greek after his ancestors, in his own tongue, as the passage says, or it was referring to himself either way. But if this is true, wouldn't there be more Greek near there? Maybe something really significant close by that would be undeniable? Well, We'll get to that, but first, we wish to note that the Spanish attempted to rename this mountain as well, unsuccessfully proving its name, Apo, is of more ancient origin and not Spanish. Here is a Spanish map from 1571 in which Mount Apo appears, but with its new Spanish name, Monte de Calata. Notice the list of rich resources this map documents in the Philippines as well. Very close to the description of Solomon's Navy. In 1734, same. Monte di Calata. In 1785, same Monte di Calata. No, the name Apo did not come from Spain. So, are there other landmarks with Greek names? Well, just the very city at the foot of Mount Apo, Davao. This is also a word of Greek origin, meaning menstruation. We know, yuck, right? Why would anyone name an area after a woman's cycle? Well, 
wasn't this the curse of Eve? Doesn't this bring us back to the land of Havila, the land of Adam and Eve after the flood, which bore a similar meaning that suffers pain that brings forth? Was Tarshish actually honoring the ancient Hebrew name Havila, which is defined with Eve's curse from the garden as the Greek word for the same curse? Hmm, now we're talking. Wow. And here's another for posterity's sake, Mount Kanlaon. In Negros Occidental is Greek for at least God's people. There we go again. We do not place Negros in Tarshish, but perhaps it is. Therefore, it is our hypothesis that Luzon and surrounding isles are Ophir, Cebu, Bahul, and surrounding isles are Sheba, and Tarshish is Mindanao, Samar, and in between. And the area of Tarshish includes the areas of Tarshish's maritime brothers, Kittim, Elisha, and Dedan, Dodan, Dodanim, whichever name you wish to use. Remember, there are over 7,000 islands in the Philippine archipelago, thus plenty of room for all of these names and many, many more. Wow, this is exciting. We truly believe that God is unveiling His Word here, and everything, history, geography, and now even language, tie into the Bible account for our search for Solomon's gold. No other area on earth fits like this, and anyone watching this entire series can scarcely question that the Philippines is Ophir, Tarshish, and Sheba. Stay tuned for our final two videos in this series, Part 8, Not Ophir, exploring the other claims and obliterating them, and Part 9, Future Prophecy of Ophir. Thank you for watching our Solomon's Gold series. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and view our website at thegodculture.com. Always remember to prove all things for yourself. Thank you.